Stand with me, would you please, for the reading of God's Word this morning. The scribes and the chief priests sought to lay hands on him at that very hour, for they perceived that he told this parable against them, but they feared the people. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be sincere that they might catch him. I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong passage. I think I'll preach on the next one this morning, okay? Luke 20, verse, beginning in verse 27. Try that. Then came to him some Sadducees, those who denied that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies having a wife but no children... The man may take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now, there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second, and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterward, the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will this woman be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die any more because they are equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised... Even Moses showed in the passage about the bush, where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for all who all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word. Pray that you will uh, today enlighten our minds, Father, help us to understand what it is you're saying here and help us to understand how it applies to our lives here in the 21st century. We thank you that the word never returns void. Just pray that the messenger will not get in the way this morning, but that you will indeed be able to minister to our hearts all that we need. We do lift those up who have been mentioned this morning and, and many others who were not mentioned. Um, we, Lord, our hearts are often <clears throat> burdened with the, overwhelmingly with the, with, the, with the things that people are going through. But we ask for your comfort, for your help, that you will lift them up. We pray for the bigger picture that the broader intentions of your plan will be worked out in these lives. Pray for our missionaries. Pray for, Lord, I think of Julie going down to Guatemala this, this coming week. I think of the building team going down Thursday, uh, the elders and deacons. There's so many things going on, Lord. I just pray that you will bless each one of those. Use them for your glory. That your name will be lifted up. We long above all things, Father, that you be that you be glorified, that you be considered the most important thing in life. We pray that your kingdom will come, that your will will be done. How we look forward to the day when that will be completely true. Lord, help us now as we look to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I want to make one clarification. While Jesse uh, approved of you closing your eyes while you were saying the memory verse, uh, I would prefer that you keep them open <laughs> now. Um, if you could, um, I can see why that might be a good thing for him, would not necessarily be a good thing for me. So, uh, so uh, if you will please. In 1971, uh, the former Beatle, John Lennon, released one of the most popular rock songs of all time. Imagine that there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. I think it was probably popular because it caught the mood 
of our culture and of our society, a time when we are really dedicated to the idea of naturalism, the idea that either God doesn't really exist at all, or if he does, he kind of put it all in motion and then stepped back. He has no true involvement in modern life. Forget about the afterlife. Live the best life that you can today in peace and harmony. And that was the message. Lenin gave it new expression, perhaps, but it's as old as mankind. And I quote it this morning because it is particularly fitting for this first century group that we've just been introduced to in the book of Luke, the Sadducees. It's the first time they appear in this book. We've talked about them a little bit before, but this is their first appearance. The Sadducees were the aristocrats of their day. They were the blue bloods. They were the ones who had been born and who basically society revolved around rather than them trying to, they invented society rather than the other way around. They were the priestly group in Palestine that gave them special uh, position anyway. They would collaborate with anyone, including Rome, as long as they could maintain the status quo. That was their real goal in life, not to lose their position, not to lose their money. They were rich, they were the rich, and they were part of the Sanhedrin, the ruling group in Palestine. Remember, we had this 71-person Sanhedrin that ruled the roost in Palestine. It was comprised of different groups, including Sadducees and Pharisees. They were as unlike as they could be, both politically and theologically. So you can imagine the contention among that group. The only thing they ever agreed on was they hated Jesus. So this is the Sadducees. We're introduced to them for the first time. The Pharisees were popular with the people. The Sadducees were hated by the people. The overwhelming characteristic of their existence was that they were naturalists. They were first century naturalists. This seems very unusual because they were the priestly, priestly group. But even though they were part of the priestly group and did believe that God created in the beginning and subscribed to the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, they didn't believe any of the rest of the Old Testament. They basically discounted it. Torah was the only thing. Now that'll be important, very important next week. We won't See, so much important attached to that this week, but next week we will. They were naturalists. They rejected the immortal duration of the soul, quote. They did not believe in heaven, did not believe in hell, did not believe in judgment, didn't believe in resurrection, didn't believe in an afterlife, didn't believe in angels. In other words, anything that had an inkling of supernatural, they did not believe in. Sound familiar? What's interesting is, I think most naturalists look at those of us who are believers as being naive people. Perhaps you've run into that. If you haven't, I can only conclude your witness has not maybe been what it should be. Naturalists will look at you as naive. They will mock you for your beliefs. And that same was true in first century Israel. But Jesus is going to show here in this passage that the naivety belongs to the naturalists. The naturalists are the ones who do not understand. The naturalists are the ones who are missing something very important. And in these last three days of his life, remember Jesus has cleansed the temple, and so he's now using it for its intended purpose, teaching all who are coming, and people are flocking to him because they are in town for Passover, coming from all parts of the world to Palestine to return for this important time of year. And now they're hearing about this one who has sort of come out of the woodwork in Israel. And they're flocking to hear Jesus. But all the religious elite, the scribes, the Herodians, the Pharisees, they're coming at him from all angles in Jerusalem to ask him questions that they hope will pin him to the wall. They want to discredit him in the face of all of these people. And so far, he's tripped them all up. They've all had to go away like, you know, whipped dogs with their tail between their legs. So last of all, here come the Sadducees. This is the aristocracy, if you will, coming out of hiding. You could think of it this way. It's almost like they are 
so sure that their naturalistic presuppositions will win the day. It's kind of like they're walking up now after everybody else has had the try and kind of saying to, to the Pharisees and the scribes and the rest of them, step aside, boys. Let us show you how it's done. That's who we have coming to Jesus on this particular occasion. They think that they will win with their naturalistic presuppositions. But once again, Jesus sends them away in flames. And along the way, we're going to learn a lot about the Bible, a lot about resurrection, a lot about heaven, and the afterlife. It's a spellbinding encounter that goes on. We're going to look at it basically uh, over the next couple of weeks. First, we have the diabolical ruse. It takes just a couple of minutes. And then the dazzling response that we'll divide into two parts. So what's the ruse? Well, the ruse is this. They refer back to Deuteronomy 25, where provision had been made in the law of Moses. Remember, this would have been part of their scripture, the last a book of their scripture, actually that if a man were to die childless, his bachelor brother was to marry his widow and raise up children in the dead brother's name. They were to do this on penalty of shame to the family if it wasn't carried out. It was called a levirate marriage, meaning a marriage of one brother to a wife of, of a brother who had died. The Sadducees were well aware of this provision and wanting to poke fun at the afterlife, they either make up this scenario or perhaps it actually happened where it's really not completely clear from the passage. But either way, they come and say to Jesus, you know, listen, here's what happened. This, this, this woman had a husband and he died. And so the second brother in the group took her as wife and then he died. And then the third brother took her as wife, and then he died, and it went on to the seven. Now, the, you know, the breakdown in the story to me is this. If you were brother number four, would you be marrying this black widow? <laughs> or would you be heading out of Dodge, you know, finding somewhere else to go? I think I'd be gone, shame to the family or not. But in any case, they proposed the scenario where all seven brothers marry her, all seven brothers die. And now they have this, what they think is their unanswerable question. So what's going to happen to her when she gets in heaven? Is she going to be trailing around with seven husbands? That's their scenario. They think that they will have Jesus backpedaling all the way to Galilee. They're making a joke of heaven. It's a grotesque scenario. A woman with seven husbands, how in the world is God going to handle that? Doesn't this remind you of naturalists, though? I mean, the, the favorite ploy, I think, of naturalists is to poke fun at anything that's, that speaks of faith or that speaks of God, to poke fun so that they can justify ignoring God. The, the idea is as old as Jesus himself. At his arrest, we read in Luke 22, verse 63, now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him. As they beat him, they also blindfolded him and kept saying, prophesy, who is it that struck you? You know, listen, he could have told them not only who it was who struck him, but he could have given them their whole family history, right? But he doesn't. Unfortunately, they equated inactivity with inability, which was not true. So they were doing it back then. They're doing it today. The theologian liberal theologian, Rudolf Bultmann, years ago, he said this, and he had a book called Kerygma and Myth. I hope you never have to read it. Some of us who are in seminary did. Uh, in it, he did have one interesting statement. He wrote this. He said, it is impossible to use electric lights and the wireless and to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries and at the same time to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. He objects to anything supernatural. He goes on and says, I use an electric razor. No man who uses an electric razor can believe that Jesus walked on water. And I'm asking myself, what's the connection here? <laughs> Just because I use an electric razor, somebody couldn't have walked on water? But you, you see what he's saying. He's saying we're so, we're so sophisticated. We know everything now because we know about electric razors. So we know that this 
all these miracles in the Bible couldn't really have happened. What foolishness, right? Using mockery to discredit the supernatural, just like the Sadducees did. The question is, does the fact that a woman have seven, had seven husbands mean that they could not somehow coexist in heaven? Jesus is going to take that question on with no problem. But, but, you know, we should ask seriously, is there really even a connection between this and that? But that's what the, that's what the message is, isn't it? We know everything now. We know so much that we know that these miracles that people believed in back then, just myth, could not possibly be true. So that's the ruse that they come with. How about Jesus' dazzling response? Now, to get the full impact, we need to go back to Matthew 27. So if you just turn back a couple of books to Matthew 27, where there's a, uh, there's a more complete, a parallel passage that has a little bit more information than we have in the book of Luke. In Matthew, uh, it's not Matthew 27, sorry, Matthew 12. In Matthew 12, we have the same thing. The same, the same Sadducees are coming and they're posing this question to Jesus. And they had basically asked the same question. So whose wife will she be since all seven had her? Presupposing, of course, you can only have one, one husband or one wife in heaven. So who is it going to be? And Jesus answers in, Ma- in Matthew 12, beginning in verse 29. Jesus says... Um, Jesus says, you are wrong because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. You know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. I mean, what authority is that? Here he is, he's standing toe-to-toe with the creme de la creme of the religious people of his day, the priestly group. And he's saying, "Um, you guys have a little problem here with your question." Your question shows that you don't know the Scriptures and you don't know the God behind the Scriptures. You may be priests, but you don't know the Bible and you don't know God. I mean, that's pretty authoritative, isn't it? Here are the most educated people in his land and he's coming out of Palestine, out of Galilee, in one of the, in, in one, you know, it's like, it's like uh, coming out of the South, I guess, in the United States, because he's got an accent. They think he doesn't know anything, not nearly as educated as them. And he looks him right in the eye and says, you guys are wrong. You don't know either God's might or God's message. You know either one. Because if you did, you'd realize how wrong you are. You may have titles, but you are God illiterate. You are God illiterate illiterate. So over the next two weeks, what I want to do is really examine what it means not to understand God's might, and then what it means next week not to understand God's message, not to understand the Scriptures. You don't understand God's power. This is common to all naturalists. Of course it would be, right? They're in denial that either God exists or if he does, that he is involved in this earth, so they deny God's power. But you know, this is again not an old contention. It's been around forever. That's why Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I guess they missed Sunday school on that day, right? They thought that God was powerless when actually he's just different. He does things differently than we do them. Have you noticed that? I mean, almost every prayer I have, I know exactly how it should be done. Are you the same way? I don't pray without thinking this is the way it should be done. And almost every time, God answers in some other way that's better. Because God's ways are higher than ours, right? God's ways are different than ours. They didn't get that. So what is it about God's power that we need to understand that's in this passage? Well, number one, he has the power to save. God has the power to save. This is the first problem with naturalists. They're not even saved. You can't be a naturalist and be saved. You can't be a naturalist and be on your way to heaven. 
You can't subscribe to naturalism as the philosophy of life and as the worldview that you adopt and be a Christian. The two are incompatible. And so Jesus says to these men, if you're back in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 20, Jesus says to these men in verse 34, he said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But notice now verse 35, but those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and the resurrection of the dead, in other words, those who are going to heaven, those who are considered worthy for that, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. And we'll talk about the marrying given in marriage in next week, but right now I want to concentrate on those who are worthy. Who is worthy to attain the age to come? Who is that? Most people, when I ask that question, it's, you know, those who are doing their best. Or those who are, you know, these people might have answered, it's those who are Jewish people because we're God's chosen people. Those who are leaders of the Jews. Perhaps those who are rich and God's blessing is shown in their lives because they are rich. Listen, these guys had all of those things. And what Jesus is saying is it's not enough. That won't do so what is that that will do? Well, Jesus had mentioned that way back in Matthew 5, verse 20, during the time when he gave the Sermon on the Mount. In, in Matthew 5, verse 20, he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds, unless your righteousness, now listen to this phrase that he gives, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a pretty strong statement, isn't it? And to the Jewish people, that would have been a particularly strong statement because as far as they were concerned, nobody's righteousness exceeded that of the scribes and Pharisees. If you ask them who's the best person morally that is around, they would have said it's the scribes and Pharisees. They're at the top of the heap. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but it's not good enough. It's not good enough. If that's what you're hoping for, if the kingdom of heaven is your goal, if you want to be there with God forever, then your righteousness is going to have to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. Wow. So how in the world can I have righteousness that's going to exceed the scribes and Pharisees? Well, Jesus answers that question in John 6. In John 6, at the time that he fed the 5,000, and they came around the next day and wanted more food, and he told them, listen, forget the food that you got. I know why you're here. I know you're here for more food, but I'm going to tell you what you really need to be doing is you need to be doing the work of God. And so you come down to John 6 and verse 28, and they said to him, what must we do then to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God. Do the best you can. Is that what he said? That's not what he said, is it? This is the work of God. Keep the Ten Commandments. Is that it? That's not it. This is the work of God. Come to the temple every week and bring your sacrifices. Is that what he said? No. What Jesus said is, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. In other words, you've got to believe in me. You must believe in me. How does that give you righteousness greater than the Pharisees? Paul answers that question, doesn't he? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. If that's not a verse that you know, you need to you know, put it on your mirror. I know Jesse's got you there in Philippians 2, 9, but somewhere along the line you need 2 Corinthians 5, 21. It's one of the greatest verses in the Bible, if not the greatest verse in the Bible. For our sake, He, God the Father, made Him to be sin who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God through Him. Whose righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes? God's does. And how do you get that? By putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. It's the thing we've talked about so many times. It's the greatest trade 
in history. Your sin for his righteousness. That's what salvation is all about. Who else has the power to save? To save from sin, not the Pharisees. They couldn't even save themselves, let alone somebody else. Not the Sadducees. Not you, not me, not mom. Not, I don't know who you're depending on to save you, but it can only be one place that you find salvation, and that's in God. God can save. God has the power to save. When I attended Biola University, Biola was originally, it was, you know, at that time we had a campus out in La Mirada, uh, California, right on the border between Los Angeles County and Orange County. And it was a wonderful little campus out there in suburbia, but Biola originally started in downtown Los Angeles. And the, the, uh, the school was located in this high-rise building. I don't know how many stories it was, but at the time it was built, it was one of the tallest buildings in Los Angeles. Not anymore, but it was at the time. And there was a huge sign at the top of that building that was lit up at night. Jesus saves. It was a great sign. But the naturalists in my day, a lot of the kids I knew, and even some of them that were going to school there, had a lot of fun with that sign. Jesus saves? Where? First National Bank? Jesus saves what? Green stamps? We had a lot of fun mocking and poking fun at the sign that says, Jesus saves. Let me tell you, beloved, the mockers will one day learn that the sign was right and that they were wrong, right? Jesus does save, but he's the only one who can. The Sadducees didn't understand that. Their naivety about the power of God was going to be their condemnation because the only salvation that was available and is available, has to come through him. Jesus can save, God can save through and because of the death of Jesus Christ. The Sadducees didn't understand the power of God and they missed eternity. God has the power to save. Second thing they missed here is that God has the power to raise. God has the power to raise. Back in Luke 20, resurrection is mentioned twice in this passage, in verse 35 and then again in verse 36. What the Sadducees denied, that even the possibility of resurrection, didn't believe in it. They were naturalists. What they denied, Jesus just takes for granted. They denied it because was the normal course of events, and it's not, right? They denied it because it went against the laws of nature as they understood them, right? They denied it because they'd never seen it happen. They denied it because it wasn't normal. They didn't think it could ever happen, but they didn't understand the power of God. He made the laws of nature. He's not subject to the laws of nature. Do you see the difference? If you make the law, you can do whatever you want to with it. Jesus' own resurrection would soon blast the idea that God could not raise from the dead. But let's give the Sadducees credit. That's a couple days in advance, right? It's gonna, not going to happen for the next five days or so. They hadn't seen that yet. So you might say, well, we should give them a pass. Well, not really. Because just... The week before this, in Bethany, two miles down the road from Jerusalem, there was a resurrection. Jesus came to town and resurrected from the dead his friend Lazarus. Remember that? Jesus got word, Lazarus is sick, you better come, and Jesus delayed for two days. He did that because by the time he got there, Jesus, uh, Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. And by Jewish law, you were certainly dead after three. So he was just making sure everybody understood he was dead. The sisters knew it. When he came and he said, uh, open the tomb, they said, oh, Lord, we don't want to do that. He stinks by this time. Lazarus was dead in a, as a doornail, and Jesus 
cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And what happened? Here he came, fresh as a newborn baby. The very thing the Sadducees denied had happened in their own backyard about three or four days ago, right? You say, well, maybe they didn't know about it. Well, not according to John 11. You may want to turn there. According to John 11, verses 46 and 47, after Lazarus had been resurrected, word had filtered back to the Sanhedrin, which, if you'll recall, included the Sadducees. So did they check it out? Did they investigate? Did they, you know, they, they, hey, maybe we better get all this guy Lazarus and interview him, find out what's going on here. Did they do all of that? Did they do any of that? No, they did what naturalism always does. It denies what it doesn't want to believe. And that's what they did. Look at verse 53 of John 11. So from that day on, they made plans to put Jesus to death. <laughs> He just resurrected his friend from the dead. So what did they do? They said, well, we better kill him. Let's kill him. And when they found out that others were going to see Lazarus and were interviewing him and were coming back believing, according to John chapter 12, verse 10, so the chief priests, which would be the Sadducees, made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Their unbelief made killing machines out of them. Amazing, isn't it? But this is what unbelief does. This is what naturalism does. This is what a refusal to believe in the revelation that God has given us, this is where it leads. Naturalism is so naive that it, will even it won't even believe the evidence that's right in front of it. In fact, it'll deny it, and it'll lie about it. I just read a book this week. It was an interesting book called Subverted. It was, it was by a young lady. Well, she was young at the time. I think she's about my age now, so she's not young anymore. But when she was young, she worked for Cosmopolitan Magazine. She came out of the journalism school at the University of Missouri, which is a very honored school. And she went to work at Cosmopolitan. She said, the day I walked in the door, all the ethics that I'd been taught about journalism at the School of Journalism at the University of Missouri went out the window. She said it was specifically coming down from Helen Gurley Brown. Some of you will remember her from the top, the editor of Cosmopolitan. They were making up all these stories about sexual liberalism, uh, 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 liberation and, and about feminism and and, 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 and all of these things that, that were purporting to free women from this subservience they'd been in. And I'm not denying that there was some of that going on, but what they were doing in these stories, she learned, this, this, this woman learned right away was, you just, if you needed an anecdote, make it up. If you need statistics, make it up. And she said, we were regular. Every article we published, we were making up the stories and we were making up the statistics. It's the old adage, the bigger the lie and the more you tell it, the more people will eventually believe it. Amazing. Because naturalists will not accept the possibility of supernatural if it's right in front of them. Sadducees did not believe the power of God for the simple reason that in their view it wasn't on display every day. The irony of the fact is that it was on display every day, right? God says this in Romans 1. You remember this statement. He says, For the as invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. In other words, my power is on display every day. All you got to do is look outside. Just look. They refuse to do that. But see, God's power is evidenced in what he's created. God's power is evidenced in the creation. You know, the, the irony of this is that the naturalists who deny the power of God are actually an evidence of the power of God because <laughs> naturalism itself is an evidence of the power of God. Nature itself is an evidence of the power of God. There's no naturalistic explanation for the universe. You say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, the Big Bang. Well, fine. 
But all the Big Bang does is push the ultimate question back a little further, because you're still left with, where did the energy and the material come from that, caused, that, that, that the Big Bang consisted of? Who made something out of nothing? There's no scientific evidence for anybody being able to do that. You know that, right? Who caused the bang to happen? There is no scientific evidence to show how that could have been a possibility. Scientists claim to define that down to now fractions of a second what happened after the Big Bang happened, but they have no explanation for how it happened to start with. Beloved, the power of God is on display constantly. It's on display every time you take that seed and plant it in the ground and it germinates. Explain that. The power of God is on display in nature in every fertilized egg. It's on display in every feeling of shame and in every act of love. There is no natural explanation for any of those. And we could go on and on and on and on. The power of God is on constant display. And the same God who controls the natural also controls the supernatural. The same God who controls the natural also controls the supernatural. Though resurrection is not an everyday event, it is completely within his power. Completely. That's what the resurrection of Lazarus was all about. That's what the resurrection of Jesus was eventually going to be all about. And turn, turn with me back to Matthew 27. I want you to see this. The moment that Jesus died, look what happened. Matthew 27. It's one of those, you know, sort of short, bizarre <laughs> passages of Scripture that sometimes we just overlook. But look at this. Matthew 27, beginning in verse 51. It says, when Jesus died, behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. This is the power of God on full display, right? But he's not done yet. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. That was a sad day to be a Sadducee, wouldn't you say? Sad day to be a Sadducee. Here come friends and relatives of people who have been dead, and now here they are suddenly walking the streets again. How do you explain that? And then what happened to them? The Bible doesn't tell us. I don't know. I think I... No. I think they're part of the first fruits that just went right on following the resurrection of Christ to join him in heaven. That's what I think happened bodily. Because Paul says this about the resurrection. He says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He's the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, he's just the first of many to come. There are many to follow. Jesus was resurrected by God because God has the power to raise. And the Sadducees' belief to the contrary didn't make it so. God proved it over and over in their own time. They were not willing to look. Sadducees got it all wrong because they chose not to believe that God could raise the dead. He can, he did, and he will. So God has the power to save. They didn't know that. God has the power to raise. They didn't know that. God has the power, thirdly, to change. He has the power to change. All naturalists subscribe, consciously or unconsciously, to the theory of uniformitarianism. You say, what in the world is that? Well, it simply means this. It means it's the theory that everything is going on now as it always did. The uniformity of nature means that you can't violate any of the laws of nature. It is uniform. The idea is that everything 
has and always will operate according to the same unchangeable laws. To the Sadducees, that basically meant no life after death. Nobody had seen it. Nobody could prove it. Nobody could demonstrate it. So to them, it didn't exist. But even if it did, in their limited minds, it would have to operate on the same principle as this life, meaning one woman, one husband. It's the main assumption behind their, behind their mocking image of some poor woman arriving in the afterlife and then, I guess, having to choose which one does she really want to live with. I, you know, such mockery. Assumed the same rules apply there as apply here. But again, they drastically underestimated God, right? They drastically underestimated the one who was standing before them. Jesus, who had existed in the afterlife long before he came to this world, knew something they didn't know. He knew that the rules are not necessarily the same. They're different there than they are on earth. A lot of things are the same, but many things are different. God has the power to change. And so Jesus could authoritatively inform them, oh, guess what, guys? I know you're worried about this marriage, but there isn't any marriage in heaven. Really? How do you know that? I've been there. You've been there? Mr. Sadducee, have you been there? Marriage as we know it in our fallen world will not exist in the world to come. Why? Verse 36, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Now, there, there are several things in that verse we need to know. First of all, it pulverizes the idea that there are no angels, right? Sadducees didn't believe in angels. Jesus not only believed in them, he didn't even argue the point. He just assumes it. Why wouldn't he? He's been there, and they haven't. He's seen them. In fact, John 1, 3 says this. We don't want to forget this. It says, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Not only had Jesus been there and seen the angels, he created them in the first place. Case closed on the angels, right? So then he says this. He says that people in heaven are equal to the angels. Now notice he doesn't say that they are angels. You know, like some of these popular books that are going around or have gone around a few years ago where the people in heaven were having wings and stuff like that. Beloved, check it against the Bible. They are equal to angels in what sense? They cannot die anymore. That sort of violates natural law, doesn't it? We know we're going to die. If there's anything we know, we're going to die. Even Benjamin Franklin knew that. It's, it's death and taxes. They're the only two sure things, right? They're going to die. It's a natural law, but not in heaven. They are equal to the angels because they don't die. God has the power to make it that way. Now, it's interesting. Jesus doesn't address the issue of sexual identity here. And I don't know of anywhere in the Bible that does. So the question, you know, that arises, we, angels don't appear to have any sex. They're called he's because that's the terminology that the Bible uses for general, um, generally identifying a being. But we don't, we don't know that the angels have any sex. So will we who have had a sexual identity here, I'm a man, I'm a man somebody else is a woman, my wife is a woman, will we still be man and woman in heaven even though not married? It's possible. Don't know. We don't know. The Bible doesn't speak to that. But we do know this. People will live forever. We know there will be no marriage as such. There will be no, reprodu there will be no need for reproduction. There will be need no need to repopulate. There will be no need for families. It's one big family there. Do you understand? Now, this is kind of a footnote, but I think it's important to address it. Because, I, I, you know, for some... For some Maybe some here, I don't know, but for some, the idea of no marriage in heaven probably sounds like a great thing, right? So welcome thought. I, I hope, hope you're not one of those if you're married. For others, like myself and Patty, I mean, it's hard to get, around, get your arms around the idea that you can have an ideal existence without marriage, right? I'm sure many of you who are here this morning feel that way. It's usually a question that comes up when you're talking about heaven. What about this no marriage thing? That bothers me. 
I'm concerned about that. But beloved, we must not fall into the same trap that the Sadducees did. We must not limit the power of God to make everything wonderful. Heaven's going to be great. Heaven is a sinless place where absolute, comprehensive, total love dominates. It's everywhere. So take the most glorious moment that you've ever had in your marriage relationship, if you're married, think about that moment. Multiply it a million times, and you'll just begin to understand what heaven is going to be like all the time. Get your arms around that. That's what heaven is going to be. I, let, let me tell you this. We won't be in heaven for two seconds, and this will be a non-issue. So don't let it be an issue for you here. It'll be a non-issue. God will never take something away that he doesn't give back something infinitely better, right? He wouldn't do that. If, it, here's another way to think of it. If God can make marriage great enough in this broken, fallen environment that we don't want to leave it behind, what is heaven going to be like? You just, just, this is God's challenging us to have a little faith, right? To have a little trust. Don't underestimate God's power to save, to raise, and to change. Let me close with this illustration. Author and speaker Ravi Zacharias. Indian born, wonderful man. Somehow he's an apologist for the Christian faith. A gentle man who has been able to have an audience at the highest levels of government and of uh, the, in our world. He's welcome, it seems like, everywhere in representing Christ. He's, he's, got, he's had an amazing career. But he says this. He says, during the course of nearly 40 years on every continent... I have seen the most hardened criminals touched by the message of Jesus. I have seen ardent followers of radical belief systems turned from being violent, brutal terrorists to become mild, tender-hearted followers of Jesus Christ. And then he begins to talk about nations trying unsuccessfully to ban Christ. His example is China. He says this, for example, China, in the middle of the 20th century, after destroying all the Christian seminary libraries in the country, Chairman Mao declared that the last vestiges of Christianity had been permanently removed from China, never to make a return. On Easter Sunday in 2009, close to half a century later, the leading English language newspaper in Hong Kong published a picture of Tiananmen Square on page one with Jesus replacing Chairman Mao's picture on a gigantic banner. I've been there in Tiananmen Square. I remember the banner of Mao up there. It dominates the whole square. Easter, 2009, instead of Mao up there on the wall, it was Jesus. He had the words under the picture that said, Christ is risen. It is estimated that the church in China is the fastest growing church in the world. I have had conversations with young students in one of China's most prestigious universities who were eagerly asking their questions about Christ, some confessing that their faith in Christ is now the most remarkable thing about their lives. Listen, when Mao was doing all this at a slow point, there were less than a million Christians in China. Today there are over a hundred million Christians in China. Don't tell me that God doesn't have the power to save and to raise and to change. He absolutely does. Beloved, naturalism is wrong. It's naive. It's fatally wrong. Don't imagine that there's no heaven, because there is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word from you. Thank you for the encouragement it brings. Thank you for the strength of your message. Thank you that 
Lord, the best and brightest of your time could never bring a question that you couldn't answer, that you didn't know how to deal with. And thank you that along the way you teach us so much about your word, about revelation, about God, about heaven, about love, things that we need to know. And so I pray this morning, pray for anyone here who is, maybe they are a naturalist, living as though you didn't matter. Lord, I pray that this would be the day that they open their heart to you. For those of us who know you, Father, would you strengthen our faith, and then would you please stir our spirits to be the kind of witness you want us to be to those who do not know you. It doesn't matter whether they mock or not. Lord, not everybody that heard your message repented. Many did not. Most did not. So why should we think we'd be any different? But let us be faithful. Let us be true to you. Let us be true to your word. Because it's true. Bless us now as we sing this song, Lord. Make it, may it be the prayer of our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.